Om Namo Narayanaya. Welcome back. Today we are continuing chapter 8 from verse 10. So, I do have to let you know, as I always do, this is not my first time reading this. I have read it twice before. Both times I was filming. And the first time, I forget what happened. Either there was a noise outside or maybe a siren or I was just interrupted or something. So I did it again and I'm going along and I looked up and my camera had stopped recording because it was out of space. So, here we go. Take three. Let's hopefully get this one down. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be doing a take four and letting you know about that adventure. At that time, when the three worlds were submerged in water, Garbal Dakashi Vishnu was alone, lying on his bedstead, the great snake, Anatta. And although he appeared to be in slumber in his er own internal potency, free from the action of the external energy, his eyes were not completely closed. Just like the strength of fire within fuel wood, the Lord remained within the water of dissolution, submerging all the living entities in their subtle bodies. He lay in the self-invigorated energy called Kala. The Lord lay down for a thousand cycles of four yugas in his eternal potency, and by his external energy he appeared to be sleeping within the water. When the living entities were coming out for further development of their fruitive activities, accentuated by the energy called Kala Shakti, he saw his transmental body as bluish. The subtle subject matter of creation on which the Lord's attention was fixed was agitated by the material mode of passion, and thus the subtle form of creation pierced through his abdomen. Piercing through this sum total form of the fruitive activity of the living entities took the shape of the bud of a lotus flower generated from the personality of Vishnu. And by his supreme will, it illuminated everything like the sun and dried up the vast waters of devastation. Into that universal lotus flower, Lord Vishnu personally entered as the super soul, and when it was thus impregnated with all the modes of material nature, the personality of Vedic wisdom, whom we call the self born, was generated. Brahma, born out of the lotus flower, could not see the world, although he was situated in the world. He therefore circumambulated all of space, and while moving his eyes in all directions, he achieved four heads in terms of the four directions. Lord Brahma, situated in that lotus, could not perfectly understand the creation, the lotus, or himself. At the end of the millennium, the air of devastation began to move the water and the lotus in great circular waves. Lord Brahma, in his ignorance, contemplated, who am I that am situated in the top of this lotus? Where from has it sprouted? There must be something downwards, and that from which this lotus has grown must be within the water. Lord Brahma, thus contemplating, entered the water through the chana, channel of the stem of the lotus. But in spite of entering the stem and going near to the navel of Vishnu, he could not trace out the root. Ah, while searching in that way about his existence, Brahma reached his ultimate time, which is the eternal wheel in the hand of Vishnu, and which generates fear in the mind of the living entity, like the fear of death. Therefore, being unable to achieve the desired destination, he retired from such searching and came back again to the top of the lotus. Thus, controlling his objectives, he concentrated his mind on the Supreme Lord. At the end of Brahma's one hundred years, when his meditation was complete, he developed the required knowledge, and as a result, he could see in his heart the Supreme within himself, whom he could not see before with the greatest endeavor. Brahma could see that on the water there was a gigantic lotus-like white bedstead, the body of Sheshanaga, on which Lord Vishnu was lying alone. The whole atmosphere was illuminated by the rays of the jewels bedecking the hood of Sheshanaga, and the illumination dissipated all the darkness of those regions. The luster of the transcendental body of the Lord mocked the beauty of the coral mountain. The coral mountain is very beautifully dressed by the evening sky, but the yellow dress of the Lord mocked its beauty. There is gold on the summit of the mountain, but the Lord's helmet, bedecked with jewels, mocked it. The mountain's waterfalls and herbs, with a panorama of flowers, seem like garlands, but the Lord's gigantic body and his hands and legs, decorated with jewels, pearls, tulasi leaves, and flower garlands, mock the scene on the mountain. 
His transcendental body, unlimited in length and breadth, occupied the three planetary systems, upper, middle, and lower. His body was a self-illuminated by unparalleled dress and was properly ornamented. The Lord showed his lotus feet by raising them. His lotus feet are the source of all awards achieved by devotional service free from material contamination. Such awards are for those who worship him in pure devotion. The splendor of the transcendental rays from his moonlight toenails and fingernails appeared like the petals of a flower. He also acknowledged the service of the devotees and vanquished their distress by his beautiful smile. The reflection of his face, decorated with earrings, was so pleasing because it dazzled with the rays from his lips and the beauty of his nose and eyes brows. Uh, my dear Vidyara, the Lord's waist was covered with yellow cloth resembling the saffron dust of the Kandamba flower, and it was encircled by a well-decorated belt. His chest was decorated with the Sri Vatsa marking and a necklace of unlimited value. As a sandalwood tree is decorated with fragrant flowers and branches, the Lord's body was decorated with valuable jewels and pearls. He was the self-situated tree, the Lord of all others in the universe. And as a sandalwood tree is covered with many snakes, so the Lord's body was also covered by the hoods of Ananta. Like a great mountain, the Lord stands as the abode for all moving and non-moving living entities. He is the friend of the snakes because Lord Ananta is his friend. As a mountain has thousands of golden peaks, so the Lord was seen with thousands of golden helmeted hoods of Ananta, Naga, and as a mountain is sometimes filled with jewels, so also his transcendental, transcendental body was fully decorated with valuable jewels. As a mountain is sometimes submerged in the ocean water, so the Lord is sometimes submerged in the water of devastation. Lord Brahma, thus looking upon the Lord in the shape of a mountain, concluded that he was Hari, Lord Vishnu. He saw that the garland of flowers on his chest glorified him with Vedic wisdom in sweet songs and looked very beautiful. He was protected by the Sudarshana wheel for fighting, and even the sun, moon, air, fire, etc. could not have access to him. When Lord Brahma, the maker of the universal destination, thus saw the Lord, he simultaneously glanced over creation. Lord Brahma saw the lake in Lord Vishnu's navel, and the lotus flower, as well as the devastating water, the drying air, and the sky, all became visible to him. Lord Brahma, thus being surcharged with the mode of passion, became inclined to create. After seeing the five causes of creation indicated by Lord Vishnu, he began to offer his respectful prayers, prayers on the path of the creative mentality. Thus ends that chapter. The next one is actually Brahma's prayers. So this would be called, I guess, the uh, creation story of Lord Brahma, how he was born, which is an interesting story. Um, you know, you can, you can take this from, from many points of view, but there was two lines that I thought were very key. So Lord Brahma's going down the stem of the flower trying to seek the source, trying to seek, you know, what's what's going on here, folks. He doesn't get it. He ends up going into meditation, and through the meditation, he finds the truth. And then eventually, where in the first, he, in the beginning, he's blind. After meditating and 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 in getting the truth, then his eyes open, and as we just read in the last couple verses, he can see everything. So if you take anything away from this, it probably should be that. The creation story is, is interesting, but it's it's giving you a message here of, you know, even Lord Brahma, the, the, the immediate creation of you know, Lord Vishnu was blinded and was seeking and seeking and seeking and spent his whole life seeking and found nothing. It was only when he meditated and stopped the seeking that he found what he was looking for. Unlike you two who still haven't found what they are looking for. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, I was part of a religious group many years ago and it was all about, are you seeking, are you seeking? Because if you find this religion and you find this guru, your seeking will end. Your seeking is over. No more seeking. We're not seeking. We're not seekers here. They used to say all the time, oh, this is such a big thing. Yet I swear every single one of them was constantly, constantly seeking. 
they were always trying to get this one more thing the guru did one more book oh if only I have another they were seeking 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 and they never really found it I don't think <laughs> but I, I just and I hear that in other religions are you seeking are you seeking so this is the big thing and according to this it's not the seeking physically it's not that one more book it's something else now one could say that me reading all the books that I'm doing on this channel is a form of seeking yeah it is I'll, I'll confess that I'm not gonna be a hypocrite and deny it at the same time I look at it though is I'm trying to get back to the source text if I'm gonna seek let's go to the source versus all the all the teachers and all the gurus and all the interpretations I've been trying to push that away a little bit and just go to the root of all their teachings so yes I'm seeking but after this there is no more Srimad Bhagavatam you know to read once you read it you've gotten to the source then it's just the tree in the branches so it's seeking but I like to think this is this is the meditative part <laughs> okay that's my excuse anyways I realized while I was reading this uh, when the first time I made this video why it didn't come out I forgot to turn on the camera <laughs> and at one and at one point I looked up while doing this and going oh yes there's about five minutes in maybe you can see it I look up and and there's a moment of relief and I realize that the camera is on <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, thoughts, comments, um, yeah, anything you want, please like, share, uh, you know, anything, and, uh, yeah, so here we go, working our way through the 33 chapters of Canto 3. Thank you for joining me, Harry Krishna, Harry Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Harry Harry, Harry Rama, Harry Rama, Rama Rama, Harry Harry.